Yeah, more or less. Okay, so last time we look at um, phase diagrams. So one way to represent a phase diagram, I guess one kind of phase diagram is the pressure uh, volume one. Um, can also be, uh, we can use the pressure uh, and temperature. And so these are just uh, thermodynamic variables, um, state variables. So uh, they are well defined for your thermodynamic system. And we looked at one particular, the one for water that looks Kind of like this. So we'll have a solid over here, liquid over here, and a gas over here. And we looked at the definition, uh, I guess several definitions. One of them is here. This point is called the triple point. Uh, all three states, solid, liquid, and gas, can coexist at that point. Uh, this point over here is called the critical point. And the, the cool thing about it, the interesting thing about it, is that below this you know, critical pressure and critical temperature. Um, below this pressure and temperature, you have a distinction between the liquid and the gas state. But above this point, there's no distinction between liquid and gas. So uh, you cannot you, know, you might think that on this side, it looks a little bit more like a liquid. On this side, uh, it looks a little bit more like a gas. Um, over here, you cannot liquefy the gas into a liquid anymore. So, you know, this, um, even though mathematically they look a little weird, you can just do this in, uh, you know, with uh, experiments, just, you know, go around this point and you will not have, um, uh, any phase transition. One way of looking at these phase transitions uh, experimentally is through the latent heat. So if you go from one phase to the other, you look at the heat capacity at constant pressure and temperature, uh, it might look something like this. So this is uh, latent heat. So if you go around this critical point, you will never see this latent heat in the heat capacity. And the other thing that we did, you know, also um, mathematically quite beautiful, is that uh, if this is a point, then this is a line, and this is the boundary between the faces. And we derived the differential equation for, for this line. So it will be the uh, dpdt or dpdl. And that equation is called the clashes clapeyron equation. And even though we use water as an example, this is completely general. Um, it works for any material function of pressure and temperature. And uh, you might have different kinds of uh, solids over here. Maybe a solid, let's call it S1, uh, where you might have S2. So the phase transitions between solids will also have a latent heat. And well, some of them at least. 
And uh, the way you distinguish them is by the atomic arrangement of your crystal or lack thereof. All right, so what we're going to look today, so we, we mentioned that the uh, flashes clapperon equation is completely independent of the of the atomistic model that you have. Right? So it doesn't care about um, the physics, maybe in a way that electromagnetism or or like quantum mechanics will care about. Instead, it tells you what is the structure that your theory, any theory that is correct, uh, should have. So now let's look at some, let's look at a model, an atomistic model that can account for uh, that behavior. The model is called uh, the Van der Waals. Um, I guess it will be a gas. So we're going to make uh, some small, I wouldn't call them corrections, but small adjustments to the ideal gas model to uh, recover some of the behaviors that we want, which I guess one of them is the fact that at the line you can have uh, two phases, right? So at the critical point you can have three, but throughout the line you can it will be a coexistence between two phases. And so this will be, you know, if we're looking at these Van der Waals gas, we might have the gas over here and the liquid over here. Okay, so this equation, uh, I guess this, this model, uh, is gonna be able to model a liquid. So what is the difference between a liquid and a gas? Uh, ions are arranged and... No, they are both amorphous. Mm. Just, I mean, like the energy, like to have a cut, you need more energy. The energy is going to be different. That, that's true, but you're in like more. Yeah, yeah. There, there's, the difference is uh, the energy is a little different. So if you just go to, you know, like you're in a, like a steam room or something, and you, you can see the, the, the steam in the atmosphere, right? It's a gas. And then you see droplets of water, liquid water. What is the difference between the molecules? Well, they're both disordered. There's no crystalline order or anything. But in the liquid, they stick together, the molecules. And in the gas, they just, um, they bounce against each other. So, in the with the ideal gas law there's no way to make molecules stick together so we have to make some small uh, yeah pretty small corrections actually or adjustments to the ideal gas and then we'll be able to get molecules to stick so van der waals uh, i actually don't know much too much about him but it's the same guy from uh, the Van der Waals attraction. So if you have graphite, for example, and a pencil, uh, you have the layers of graphene, uh, which um, yep. Which look like uh, like 
layers of hexagons of carbon, which would be a carbon atom. And they are bonded uh, in a two-dimensional way. There's no two-dimensional bonding. But there is a, a small attraction between layers, and that's why you can get graphite. But the attraction is very small, and that's why you can write with it. So he's the same dude. And one of my friends told me that this means uh, means wall. So this the last name of this dude literally is from the wall. Okay, so in order for particles to uh, attract, you need a uh, an attractive potential. So maybe you will get something that looks like that. So this is, um, let's call it R. It's just the distance between uh, particles. And this is, you know, let's call it, um, how should I call this one? I'll just call it, uh, you know, E. I'll call it uh, this epsilon. Okay, so this is just some strength. Uh, over here you have the positive, over here you have the negative. So if the overall potential is negative, then the particles are going to be bounded. This could be um, any attraction, let's say that uh, you know it's a positive and a negative ion or something like that. So this could be electromagnetic. But if you only have this interaction, what will happen to the atoms? If this is one over R negative. Well, in that case, this one goes to infinity. And so you have a, um, a pair of atoms that are uh, minimize their energy by being infinite is very, very, very close. And so uh, this will form, this will give you something that coalesce, coalesces, but uh, it's not going to have any volume. So the simplest way to uh, give you a volume, so like the particle has some volume, is to just create um, an empty core. Okay, so this is some distance. Uh, we can call it um, X or whatever, in which the particles cannot get any closer together. So they have a finite volume and you know, they are attracted to each other, so they wanna be as close as possible to each other, but they have this volume that they cannot overcome. And so that is going to be their ideal, um, uh, not their ideal, but the position or the distance between particles that minimizes the energy. So this part then doesn't exist. Okay, and if you have seen something that looks like this, it's probably the uh, Leonard Jones potential, which looks kind of like this. So again, this is the distance between the particles. Um, this is not like a completely empty core, uh, but it goes to infinity as the distance between the particles goes to zero. And so the minimum is going to be here. And so this is going to be the preferred um, the distance between particles. Okay. So the volume, the volume part, it's um, you know for the EC correction or adjustment. I don't want to say correction. It's not a correction. 
but I keep saying it. So the volume available to the particles in the system is going to be V, the volume of the system, minus the number of particles times B. And B is um, an empirical variable, it's a number. So B is kind of the, the volume per particle, right? And so the volume that the particles occupy is not available to, to the system. This is the empty, the empty core. So there's one adjustment to the volume and there is another adjustment that we have to make. Uh, this one is to the energy. So this delta U is a, um, a change in energy. It's going to be the double sum. So it is going to be this U is some interaction energy between particles I and J. And in order to calculate this delta U, you need to calculate what is the interaction between, um, between every pair of particles. So The volume is going to keep particles apart. So this delta U has to bring particles together. And so this uh, energy is going to be a, a sort of binding energy. And strictly speaking, That function, the energy, uh, is a function of the position of both uh, particles, I and J. And so you, know, you might think that these the, um, delta U is also going to be a function of the positions of the particles. And indeed it is, but if you have to include all the positions of all the particles, this will not be really uh, tractable. And so we have to make an approximation here. This is an approximation that is often done in physics, it's called uh, the mean field approximation. And so what you assume is that each of these particles is going to be moving in the mean um, energy field produced by the rest of the molecules or the rest of the particles. And all the particles are moving, yes, but on average, uh, that field is actually not going to change. Okay, so if we have many particles then we can Substitute this um, for an integral. So it's going to be uh, one half. Actually, this one I should have written it more like
know, something like that. So you don't want to have both uh, the, the J's and the I's completely because uh, these are interactions between particles that you're counting. So if you do all of them, then you're going to have two. You're going to count each bond twice. Uh, the one between particles one and two and between two and one, but they're actually the same bond. Okay, uh, so we need this one half correction for over counting. Then we can put the, we can do the integral. It's gonna be uh, d3 x, or better I'm gonna make this one you know, x and y. This is gonna be 3 dy. This is going to be the density. Um, of the I particles, the density of the Y particles. And then we have the interaction, which is a function of both. So with the mean field approximation, what we're going to say is that density is constant. It doesn't depend on X and Y. And so if it doesn't depend on X and Y, we can take it out. So this is gonna be one half N squared. We're going to assume that the densities um, are the same, you know, they're the same particles. And so now we have uh, these three guys. So there's nothing um, special about X and Y. Um, we can assume that one of them is zero. So we focus on a particle that is located at the origin. And then we just look at the interactions with every other particle. And so in that case, we can make this one function only of y. And in that case, we can just integrate this one and put it outside. This is going to be a volume. And so now we have this equation, which is not that. All right, so this one, the number density, is the total number of particles divided by the volume. This whole thing was uh, squared. And so we can get rid of this volume and this volume. And we get uh, n squared divided by v. And this guy over here, we are actually not going to uh, find the form of this potential. We're going to substitute this by negative 2a. And you'll see later why it is negative two a. It just makes the math uh, simpler. And just like b over here, which is an empirical parameter, a is also an empirical parameter. But a is hiding away um, this integral. So if we put it over here, get the delta. U is one half n squared over, oh, and it is negative. Why is it negative? Okay. 
why would you want to have a negative number here for delta u? Because it is a binding energy, right? So it has to be negative over here. Okay. So if we want this one to be negative, so attractive, then A has to be positive. Okay, so now we have these two model parameters, A and B, that we can use to uh, modify some of the equations that we used before. So the free energy of an ideal gas we derived it before uh, is negative in tau natural log of the quantum concentration divided by the concentration plus one. So this one is equation six point twenty four, and it is also equation ten point thirty four. Okay, so we're in chapter ten. So. energy of the ideal gas, if we substitute this uh, concentration, and we can put, we put in there the number of atoms and the volume, and the equation looks like that. So the first uh, correction that we're going to make adjustment so we're going to call this one F van der Waals it's minus n tau natural log of the quantum concentration instead of the volume of the whole thing this is going to be volume minus the volume occupied by the empty course of the particles divided by n plus one And if we remember that the free energy is U minus L sigma, so we need to apply this correction to the, to the uh, internal energy. And so we can just put it in there. So that's delta u. So that means that our um, free energy needs this term also. So we have this stuff over here. We have to add the correction um, for the attractive potential. Was 
it and squirt A over B. Okay, so this one over here is the free energy of the Van der Waals gas and it is equation 10.38. Right, so now we can go ahead and see. We're gonna keep it in here, but it's taking up too much space. I guess uh, it's empty core. It's very large of these uh, symbols. I'm gonna write it down here smaller. the board to myself. So we know that the pressure is minus the free energy. With respect to the volume. constant n and tau. So then if we take the derivative with respect to volume of this thingy, we will get the, the pressure. So derivative with respect to volume This one over here is minus n tau natural log of the quantum concentration plus natural log of B, B minus NB minus natural log of N plus one. minus a n squared uh, over v. And so we can forget about it, it has, about this one. The quantum concentration has no volume dependence. This one, we care about it. This one, we don't care about it. This one, we don't care about it. This one, we do care about it. So it's gonna be the partial derivative with respect to volume. Um, then we have this negative over here and this negative over here. So I can remove that negative. It's going to be n tau natural log of b divided by mb plus we have this negative over here. A n squared divided by the volume, right? So the pressure is going to be just n tau um, one over this, so divided by V minus mb. Um, then the derivative of this one, we just have the derivative of the volume with respect to volume, which is equal to one. So times one. 
and then plus um, it's going to be negative. So V to the negative one, negative A n squared divided by V squared. Cool. So this one is equation 10.39. Okay, what does the B stand for, lady? M B. Yes. Um B is the volume of a particle. Um, let me see how I can draw this. So, imagine that, you know, this is really three-dimensional, but let's focus, let's focus on the, the two-dimensional case. Um, if you put your ideal gas in this area, then the particles are going to be moving, moving around all the time, right? But, in the ideal gas, these are point particles. So they, they don't occupy any volume. So the volume available to the system you know, for the particles to move around is the volume of the system. The correction that we're making here with the van der Waals gas is saying, oh, you know, actually particles, they're not point particles. They have a small volume. So they look like that. And the particles cannot go into the volume of another particle. And so the volume available to the particles to move around is not the whole volume of the system, is the volume of the system minus the volume, combined volume of all the particles. So this B is the, the volume of one particle. Does that answer your question? Yes, of course. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you let B equals to zero and A equals to zero, it will be that the, the ideal gas law, right? Exactly. Yes. That is, that is completely correct. So in the limit of B equals zero and A equals zero, you recover the ideal gas. So these are the two small you know, additions that we made to the ideal gas law to make it a little bit more realistic. Because in order to get a liquid, you need this attraction, you know, that the particles attract uh, each other so they can you know, coalesce. Uh, but then you will also need the finite volume in order for the particles not to collapse into a single point. All right. So we can put this in the form of the uh, you know, similar to the ideal gas. So um, we can move this one to the other side. So be pressure plus a n squared divided by v squared. Then this one, we move it to the other side also. Uh, and that will be equal to, equal to n tau. Okay, so this is like the like PV equals NT or N tau, the uh, ideal gas law. So this is a correction that we made to the pressure, and this is a correction that we made to the volume. So now we can see it more clearly so that, you know, well, NB, I think, was always kind of clear, which is a correction to the volume. Um, but this one, you can see that there is a, a correction to the pressure because there is some um, 
some binding um, potential. So the pressure will actually be a little lower uh, than if you didn't have this term, you know, and you had the same V, N, and tau. The pressure will be a little lower because the particles will be coalescing a little bit. And so this equation in the book is 10.40. And it has a box around it, it is important. Well, it's enlightening. This is equation 10.40. So this is called the uh, van der Waals. Equation of state. This is an important term, equation of state. If you know the equation of state of a system, you can derive pretty much everything. And in a lot of physics, uh, research in physics uh, is focused on finding these equations of state for different systems, you know, for um, a neutron star, for a regular star, for you know, water, and, uh, and whatnot. Okay, so if you remember a state variable like uh, the the pressure, the volume, the temperature, the number of particles, so these are variables that do not depend on the history of the system, and they are well defined for any for every state of the system. So an equation of state, what it means is that it is relating state variables. So in this case, so this one over here, you know, PV equals NT or N tau is the equation of state of an ideal gas. This is the equation of state of the Van der Waals gas and it relates pressure, volume, temperature and number of particles. So you know, this is a simple equation of state. Um, often they are not as simple as this one, but this one you know, has all the, uh, all the ingredients and a little bit more complexity than just the ideal gas. Okay. So, um, See. So I'll try to get to this other thing. So what is important to notice you know, at this point is that you will see it more clearly in a little bit. But this uh, equation is uh, cubic in volume. Okay, that means that it is going to have either zero, one, or three uh, real roots. Just like In the case of a parabola, you might have two roots uh, in this region. You might have one real root over here, 
And in this region down here, you have uh, no roots, right? No, uh, no real roots, but imaginary. So for a parabola, you know, an, an equation of order two, uh, you have two roots maximum. In uh, an equation of order three, you're going to have three roots. So if we draw the PV diagram and we put, we plot this equation in here for values, well, we can find the value, a value of the temperature. So we're going to draw isotherms over here. We can find the value of the temperature for which this equation gives you only one root. So maybe maybe we'll look a little bit like that. So this is going to be the critical isotherm. What if the temperature is higher than that critical isotherm or that, sorry, that critical temperature? Well, there it's gonna look kind of like this. Right. So over here, your your roots are going to be along here. Mm. Let's see. So this one will be uh, isotherms with tau greater than the critical temperature. And then if you, this one, I'm gonna put it like this. If the temperature is lower than that, then you're going to get your, your three roots. And it's gonna look like this. So, the root will be over here or over here. So this one will start to be more exaggerated. Look like that. So after here is it decreases monotonically. This one always decreases monotonically. Uh, but this one is in this range, you have this shape. So for the critical uh, isotherm, that is variable, uh, barely noticeable. So it will look all, almost completely monotonic, except that at this point, um, the derivative is going to be uh, zero. Okay, so then you're going to start to have, you know, the, the three roots, the three volumes. You're gonna have volume one over here, volume two over here, and volume three over here. So you can have different combinations of pressure and volume that satisfy 
the equation of state. And they are going to um, represent the uh, liquid and gas. So over here, you're going to have mostly liquid. Over here, you're going to have mostly gas. This critical uh, isotherm is related in the in the PV di in the P uh, tau diagram. Is related to the critical point. So this is the temperature at which, uh, I guess, a little bit after it, you have no transition between the the liquid and the gas states. So over here, you don't have that phase transition. And uh, down here, you're going to have you know, these two uh, states. All right, so All right, so let's do some fun algebra. So we have the Van der Waals equation of state. Usually they're called EOS. Okay, so we're going to multiply that times b squared over the pressure on both sides, of course. And so this will give us, this two will cancel out. That is V squared over here. We can cancel out the volumes, so we get N squared A over P. And then we can multiply this one over here and we get V cubed minus V squared MB. Plus that one. Minus that one. Minus this one. Equals zero. So here we have the cubic equation. So the 
coefficients of this equation if we want to write it as And in the standard way, we'll get that. Um, I'm going to use the other A. Oh. Script A and script B. So script A is one. Script B is um, minus mb or we have this one too so minus n keeps us tau over p and then c so this one is going to be n squared divided by a over p, this is the model parameter a, and b is the one that has no volume dependence. So this one When we look at the, the general case in which we have only one solution, in that case, we we're just going to have the one this critical volume, so only one. And this is going to be the root. This is V minus VC squared times V minus um, VC. So we have D squared. minus bc and so when we expand the whole thing this is going to be v cube minus 3 bcp squared plus 3 bc squared v minus bc cube Okay, so now we can uh, find the critical volume by inspection because we know that it has to be of this form and we have these coefficients. Okay. Um, so what we're going to end up with So this VC cube is the one with no uh, volume dependence, it's just the, the coefficient. It's gonna be equal to, we have this negative sign over here and this negative over here. So it's just gonna be equal to cube, um, N cube. AB over P 
And then this one over here. Previous square is going to be equal to this one over here and it's positive. And then uh, this one over here, we have negative and negative. Can make it positive. Finally, this one we just have a one. There's no BC, and that is equal. One. All right. So we have that stuff. I guess now I can get rid of. Can I get rid of these ones? So what is the critical volume? To get the critical volume, we can divide VC cube, which is this one, by three VC squared. So that'll be one, that'll be VC divided by three. So it's going to be um, uh, so this whole thing already has a three. So it's just all right. So this one goes away with this one, this one with this one, this one with this one. So it's just n b, and this is equal to one third of b c. So the critical volume is three m b. This is kind of cool. Um, look at equation uh, 10.41. You will see that this is indeed the critical volume. So we can do the same thing, I'm not gonna do it, but we can do the same thing to find the, the critical pressure. So the critical pressure, we can get it from uh, this one over here. So three, Critical pressure, critical volume squared equals n squared a. Um, so if you solve for the critical pressure, you're going to get a. 
divided by 27b squared. And this is also equation 10.41. And you can also get the critical temperature. You can get it from this equation over here. We know the critical pressure and the critical volume. So the critical temperature, so the isotherm, is going to be 80A divided by 27B. Okay, and this is important because This is exaggerated, but this is your critical isotherm, has this value. Um, it's just in function of your parameters, model parameters A and B. This point is going to occur at some critical volume and some critical pressure. The volume, critical volume, is also a function only of your model parameters. And the pressure, also a function only of your model parameters. So let's look at the, the simplest one. So the critical volume, if your particles occupy more, if your particles occupy more space, then this critical volume is going to be larger. For the critical pressure, A was the strength uh, of, the, of, the, of the binding potential. And so, uh, if it is greater, then the pressure is going to be greater. And the temperature uh, depends on this too also. Um, so you can get some, um, some insight about the physics over there. So the other nice thing that you can do with this, and um, I don't think Thing. I'm going to get there, but So we can just take the equation of state The van der Waals equation of state, and we can divide on both sides by the critical volume. So we can put this one in this term, right? So then we can do divided by the critical volume, divided by the critical volume.
Then we can divide this by the critical pressure on both sides. And this one, you know, let's put it in this other term. So we're gonna get over the critical pressure and over the critical pressure. And then we can um, rearrange terms. So we're gonna look pressure over critical pressure plus is that PC? I will bring it on both sides. So up here, down here. So we can rearrange this one in terms of the pressure over critical pressure, um, volume or critical volume, and this one should be, no, it's fine. No, it's square. It's gonna look, if we let P hat be equal to that, This one and I'll add to that. We can rewrite this equation as We can just add this one here, T hat. All right, so we can cancel out some stuff over there and we end up with the simplified equation. After a little bit more algebra. So this one is equation ten point forty four, and it is called the law. corresponding states. 
So it is analogous um, to the Clash's uh, Clapeyron equation, but it is for systems, I guess uh, it has the P hat, V hat, um, it's in terms of the critical pressures, critical volume, critical temperature. And so these ones were in terms of A and B. So this is an equation uh, analogous to Clash's Clapeyron, but that includes the atomistic, the, the microscopic details um, of this system. So this equation, 10.44, is not a fundamental physics model. The Van der Waals uh, equation, you can look at it. It teaches you something about the physics, but it's, a, it's an empirical model. You know, A and B are not fundamental physical quantities. Uh, they're just model parameters. But you know, it does tell you something about the atomistic uh, interactions. All right, so I'm gonna stop over here.